tell them about, do we really understand what that word is? Do we really understand what we're talking about? Okay, so Sabbath. God is establishing an intermission, a break. Okay, six days you shall work, and then on the seventh, take a break. Okay, but, but this break is a little different because God says it's a holy gathering. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Sabbath, and uh, then we'll get into, we're going to look at when it's set up, then we're going to look at it in the New Testament in light of some of the scriptures in the New Testament. So, where do we get the Sabbath? Well, actually, it, it starts long before this. Um, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. God is finished with creation. He's looked at it and He said, it's very good. Okay? It's very good. So all of the work has been done. Let's look and see what happens next. He says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. Okay. So on the seventh day, God rested from His work. Was God pooped? No. Was God tuckered? <laughs> Whew! Wow! You know how many ants I made today? <laughs> oh! It was, it was brutal. Let's not even talk about bugs or insects or, or cows. Who thought cows would be such difficult work? I, seriously, I think sin is what screwed them up. They sure taste good, though. Okay? So, God rested not because He was tired, but because the work was complete. Okay? Um, we, we see that for the believer, there is a Sabbath rest coming. Right? Yes. Okay? So, when, when God is setting up the Sabbath, He's doing such as a picture of of what was done and what is coming, what is yet to be done. Okay, so we, we see this Sabbath rest, but then something kind of weird happens here because some 2,000 plus years later, <coughs> God addresses the Sabbath again, but, but in that interim period, there's, there's no talk about the Sabbath. There's, there's, no, there's no law, there's no rule, there's no, you know, the, this is how it's done. There's, there's nothing even to, to indicate that, that people remembered and celebrated. Uh, in this interim period, God establishes a covenant with Abraham and, and is um, a covenant of grace because of Abraham's faith. Uh, so we see this is established. No mention of the Sabbath. God doesn't tell them, okay, as a sign you'll be circumcised and celebrate the Sabbath. But it, it, it's strangely quiet for this, this period of 2,500 plus years. Okay? No mention. Then all of a sudden, wham! It's back on the scene. Alright? So... Moving forward, we're jumping all the way up to Exodus chapter 16, verse 25 and 26. Moses said, that now let me, let me give you a little bit of background on this. This is the, the manna. The manna has fallen. Okay? And, and they've been gathering the manna up. And it's the sixth day. And they're supposed to gather up twice the amount of manna. Well, this is, this is kind of weird because remember the first day they went out and they tried to, to stockpile manna. And, and they gathered a lot of it and, and they stored it away and they ate for the day. They got up the next morning and what happened? Worms. It was gross. It went bad. Worms and bleh. Nobody wanted it. Okay, but on the sixth day, Moses tells them, gather up twice as much and it will keep because of the Sabbath. Okay, so the, right at the end of this section, 
Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. This is, um, today you will not find it in the field. So he's saying this, this manna is still good. Go ahead and eat it. You're not going to find any out there. Uh, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, which is an intermission, there will be none. Okay, now think about that for a minute. Every morning they got up, what did they have to do? They had to go gather manna. Their day started with work. Going out and, and gathering in what was necessary for what? That day. And I think that's significant, folks. Uh, we just wrapped up the Ray Vanderlaan series on, on the wilderness. And one of the points that he made over and over and over again is how God wants us to depend on him every day. We like to stockpile things and we want a, a, a comfortable nest egg between us and white, what might come. God doesn't want us to get to that point where we're content and we say, okay, God, well, we're, we're good for the next six months. God wants us to live day by day. If you get the opportunity, I would encourage you. Um, it's uh, DVD number 12, right? Uh, we have it in the library. Get, take a look at what they were talking about, the green pastures for the sheep. And, and Psalm 23, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Um, God's got a funny idea of green pastures, okay? Because there was very little green to be seen where those people were pasturing their sheep. In Israel, there's only a certain amount of arable land that is suitable for planting crops. Those crops are used to feed people, not sheep. And so the arable land is, is taken up by the farmers and, and they protect it because they don't want the animals coming in and ruining their crop. So the, the places that the sheep got to go, you and I would look at and go, there is nothing there. The, for when we were in Israel, we were headed up to Shiloh and it was the first time that I got to see the, the sheep and the shepherd and, and there was a boy, I'm, I'm guessing he was about 14 years old out there and, and they're walking in nothing but rocks and dirt. And I'm thinking, he has got to be moving them from one place to another because there's nothing here for those animals to eat. Well, watching Ray Vanderlaan, there is, and it's sufficient for the moment. Not even the day, it's sufficient for the moment because you take a bite of grass and guess what? There's no more here. you got to move on. Okay, so six days you shall work on the seventh your rest. So we see this being established with the manna uh, a little bit further in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. I'm going to read this passage. Um, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, what does Sabbath mean? Intermission. Intermission. What does holy mean? Set apart. Set apart. Okay, see how easily we fall into this, this Christian ease, the Sabbath, and holy, and, and what God is really saying is, this is a break that is set apart. Okay? So, start there. Let's, let's work from that foundation. Okay? So, moving forward, um, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Okay, so um, first thing right here. There is a founding principle that, that is being established here. And it goes all the way back to Genesis. There is a principle here that God is laying out. Who knows God's creation best? God does. He knows how He designed it to work. He knows what is needful to keep it in good working order. So God 
worked for six days, he took the seventh as a rest, and he modeled that for us. First thing I want to tell you about the Sabbath today is this is for your good. Okay? This is to be a blessing to you. All right? So if you are a workaholic and your work is seven days a week, 365, you are violating the way God made you to function. Okay? You're, you're violating that principle. Okay? So let's get a little bit further into it. Uh, <coughs> the Sabbath set apart. Um, why did God make the Sabbath a law? It's one of the Ten Commandments. Um, I, I think Ezekiel <coughs> makes it very clear because when God gave the law, who did He give the law to? Moses, but and then from Moses to who? The Israelites. Now, when when God gave the law to the Israelites, did he tell them go out and enforce it on all the nations? No. No, no he didn't. As a matter of fact, he, he told them to welcome the people in, the sojourner, the people that would stay in their land and invite them to participate in the law. There were certain things that they could be, be invited into. There were certain things they could not be invited to. Unless they received the sign of the covenant. They, they became a part of the covenant. Okay, So when God gives the Sabbath, who is He giving it to? His people, the Jews. He's setting a law for whom? The Jews. The Jews. Hold that thought because we're going to come back to it. Okay, Why would God give them a law that is not being given to others? He's not telling them, go out and make this a law in all the world. I think Ezekiel gives us a little glimpse into why he was doing it. Because I think this, this covenant of the Sabbath echoes the covenant of circumcision. Look at what Ezekiel has to say. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. He says, moreover, this is God speaking through Ezekiel the prophet. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between me and and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Why does Ezekiel say that God gave him the sign? The Sabbath, why? It, it's a sign of the, 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 the agreement, the relationship between him and the Jews. Okay? The governing principle applies to mankind because all mankind is a creation. So it's subject to the rules under which God made things work, okay? But but the, the holy convocation, the holy day of Sabbath, that, that intermission that's set aside is to the Jews as a sign, okay? It's, it's a symbol to the world of that unique and special relationship that they have with the Almighty God. That sounded like a board hitting the ground. Okay? So, shake it off, buddy. So, we have the Sabbath established. What day is the Sabbath? Saturday. Saturday. When does it start? Friday. Friday night. Friday at sundown. Remember the Jewish calendar we looked at last week? Uh, in, in creation, it says that uh, on the day, the evening and then the day. So the Jews say that the, the, the day starts at sundown and goes to sundown the next day. So it starts with evening and then goes to morning. Whereas we, we start in the morning or midnight, but most of us, most of you are asleep. Um, and then we carry it through to midnight. They start it at sundown and they go to sundown because that's, that's what God did. Eh, if it's good enough for God, I, I guess it's good enough for us. Um, don't don't go and, and start telling your bosses that you're changing the calendars. And, you know, Easter starts for me today at 6 o'clock, so see ya. Um, that's not going to work, okay? So how does this affect us today? Why are we here today? Why, are we, why, why didn't we gather yesterday? Well, there's a couple things that we're going to look at. Um... First thing, Jesus was a Jew. 
Hey, this is something, guys, we have got to understand. We have got to get this knitted into our hearts, to our understanding. God sent his son as a Jew. Okay? And he sent him subject to all the laws, the, the, the law and the prophets of the Jews. Now, God gave them the law. Why? Galatians tells us that God gave us the law as, as kind of a babysitter until the righteous one would come. But it was put into effect to make us aware of our sin. Okay? If, if it was not illegal to rob, then it wouldn't be a sin to rob. Now, thankfully, God has established within all men a conscience. So we have a rudimentary understanding of right and wrong. Okay? But, but God made it very specific for the Jews, didn't he? I mean, he told them to do some things that were unique to them. Snippy, snippy. Need I say more? Okay? Specific to the Jews. Okay? Um, the tassels on the corner of their robes. Not trimming the edges of their beards. Not sowing two types of crop in the same field. Not wearing articles of clothes with two types of material. God, God made a lot of laws unique to them. What was the purpose of that? To make life hard for them? No, to make them aware of their desperate need for a Savior. Because the law makes them aware of how far removed from perfection, how far removed from God, how far removed from holiness they are. Okay? But along with this law also came a covering. Because part of the law is this is what sin is, this is how you are redeemed from sin. And we see the sacrifice instituted. Okay? The, the blood of the, the sheep and the goats and the bulls and the oxen and, and the, those, those offerings. Okay? So, when God established the law with the Jews, He did it with the purpose of making them aware of their need for salvation. Okay? Have you ever met anybody that just didn't understand why they needed to be saved? It's because they don't have the Spirit making them aware of that separation. They, they, they don't have an understanding of the law. Okay? Only the Spirit can do that. You can preach till you're blue in the face. You can talk circles around their logic, around their, their arguments, but until the Spirit gets them, until the Spirit does that work, it, it's foolishness to them. They don't get it. Don't get mad at them. Start praying. Okay? So, let's look at Jesus. First, He was a Jew. Second, He came and kept the law perfectly. Okay? Scripture tells us that He did not sin. Although He suffered every, every temptation known to man, He didn't sin. Okay? Um, in the Gospels, the, the first four books of the New Testament... The word Sabbath is used 50 times. 50. Why? Because it's significant. Because Jesus being a Jew kept the Sabbath. Matter of fact, I believe it's in Luke. It says that, that he went into the, the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. As was his habit. Okay? So, Jesus being a Jew kept the covenant of the Sabbath. He kept all of it perfectly. Okay? Now, what's interesting about this is that um, Galatians tells us that when the fullness of time had come, and some, I think the NIV says, at the right time, uh, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Okay? So, God, who is the maker of the law, is subjecting Himself via His Son, who is also God, to that law. Okay? So, we know Jesus kept it. Um, but but here, here's where things get kind of wonky on us. Okay? Because he kept it in a, in a way that was 
kind of radically different from the Jews of his day. Okay? Um, because we know in, in all four of the Gospels, each of the Gospels gives an account of him healing on the Sabbath. And what was the response from the leaders? Whoa, ho, ho, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are you violating the Sabbath? Well, was he? No. no. He said not. He said not. So why are they thinking that he's violating the Sabbath? Uh, another example. Uh, what, what, what's interesting is, is it, you, you shall do no what kind of work? What kind of work is, is it say for the Sabbath? You shall do no regular. regular work. I don't know about you, but miracles are not a regularity as part of my work. <laughs> to me, they're unique. That's part of what makes them miraculous. So when Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath and the, the withered hand, he told him to stretch out his hand and it became just as good as the other. That's not regular work. That's kind of supernatural work. That's irregular. Okay, so, so later we have a story. Um, the disciples are walking in the field and, and it's Sabbath and they're picking the grain, the heads of grain, and, and they're eating the heads of grain. And the Pharisees, whoa, 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 whoa. Why, why do your disciples do what is, is incorrect? What is against law? Why do they violate the Sabbath? Let's turn there and look at this because we're going we're gonna to kind of take a walk through this. Uh, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 6. <clears throat> so chapter 6 verse 1 on a Sabbath while he was going through the grain fields his disciples plucked and ate some of the heads of grain rubbing them in their hands isn't that weird that it says rubbing them in their hands do you guys know why it says that? Yeah, you got to get all the stuff off it so you can eat the part. I mean, you just pluck it and stick it in your mouth. I'm not a farmer, but I know that's not a good idea. All right? So they're, they're cleaning it. They're, they're getting it ready to eat. I, I, I love the, the, the little things like that that God sticks in His Word. It makes them so much more relatable, doesn't it? He says, uh, But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those that were with him. Okay, so one, we back up just a little clarification here. When God established the tabernacle, there was the, the table of showbread, the, the bread that was replaced um, and, and they would bring it in, they would present it before God in the holy place, and then they would replace it, and the bread that came out was given as, uh, as food to the priests. Only the priests were allowed to eat it. Now David was on the run from Saul, and he went to the tabernacle, and he and his men were hungry, and, and uh, the priest said, well, all that we have here is the bread, and he gave it to David. Now the priest was repaid for that with his life, because when Saul found out, he killed the priest and all that were there with him. Um, so, so he paid, but, but there's no mention that in any way God was offended by this. Okay? So, um, and, and he's calling in the big gun because David is like it as far as the Jews were concerned when it came to the king. Okay? So, verse 5, And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay? Uh, in another gospel, he actually says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay, see, that goes back to that guiding principle. God knew how he designed his creation. He knew that they would need an intermission, a break. Okay, so, but, but look what he says here. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Ooh, wow. So why were the Jews, why were the Pharisees having a problem with this? Well, we, we need to kind of step out of Scripture for a moment and look at some of the history that is not put in Scripture. Um, I'm going to read to you, I, I read this article, this is just a small portion of this article. Um, if you would like, you can find it uh, on the internet. Um, 
It's from the article, Did Jesus Break the Sabbath? by Rod Reynolds. If you look that up, you'll be able to read this article in its entirety. So I'm just going to read a little portion of it to, um, so you guys can hear. To understand what is at issue in these accounts, it is helpful to understand something of the rabbinical tradition that lay behind the Sabbath-breaking charges leveled against Jesus and his disciples. The Pharisaic tradition by Jesus' day had developed into an array of petty rules having, nothing to, or having to do with the minutia of the law. It focused on physical works that had little to do with the spirit and the intent of the law, and which in fact often violated the law. Now hold on to that thought there for a minute. Violated the law. Okay? Keep it, that in mind for a second. The scribes among the Pharisees created and transmitted the Pharisaic rabbinical traditions, the body of traditional law that they formulated, called the Halakha, preserved in the Mishnah, is extra-biblical. Okay, so the Halakha is there, these, these laws that they have written that are outside of the scope of the Bible. Uh, and you can look at it this way. When God established rules, he said, this is the boundary. Do not cross. And so the Jews went, wow, okay, that's serious stuff. We don't want to cross that line, so we're going to create a new line out here so that we won't ever cross that line. And then over the course of time, the Jews went, oh, wow, that is so serious. We better create a, a line here so that we wouldn't cross that line. That might cause us to cross the original line. Okay, and so they ended up with all of these, these, these petty rules as to how to keep the Sabbath that are extra biblical. They're not scripture. Now, this is where things get a little scary. Okay, ironically, in an attempt to ensure their, their law keeping by putting a hedge around the law, the Pharisees were breaking the law. For God had said, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take anything from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Okay. Now, he didn't just say that once, he said it twice. Okay. Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 12. By adding to the weight of, the tradition to the, uh, the weight of their tradition to the law of God, they bound heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? That you take heavy burdens and you put them on men's shoulders. Okay? The Pharisees placed the authority of their traditions above that of Scripture itself, thus going against the Word of God. Scripture scholar uh, Joachim Jeremiah affirms that for the Pharisees, the oral tradition was above the Torah. And that the esoteric writings containing scripture or scribal teachings were regarded as inspired and surpassing the canonical books in value and sanctity. Alfred Edersheim also points out that traditional law was of even greater obligation, obligation than scripture itself. Okay, so this kind of explains a little bit about this whole scenario between Jesus and the Pharisees. Matter of fact, Jesus talks about them. Why do you follow the traditions of your elders rather than what is plainly written in Scripture? Okay? Because they took these, these hedges and they said, wow, man, those guys really knew what they were talking about, so we'll not violate those. You know what? As a matter of fact, because they thought this was so dangerous, we should probably make this rule right here. And then over a period of time, they went, wow, those guys really knew what they were talking about because, man, if they didn't put that hedge there, you might could cross that hedge from those guys. And, and over the course of time, these writers and, and these rabbinic teachers became so deified that they supplanted the importance of Scripture. Okay? This is what's going on when Jesus starts to come down on them. He calls them whitewashed tombs sepulchers filled with dead man's bones. Okay? He called them serpents. He said, you, you walk the length and the breadth of the land to make a single convert, and then you make him twice the son of perdition as you are yourself. You take him up to the very gates of heaven itself, and then you deny him entry. Okay? That's heavy stuff. <coughs> right? We, we kind of get like that ourselves, don't we? We, we, we read the, the truth of Scripture, and, and then we start making things that are categorically sin that really Scripture doesn't address. I remember way back in the day, 
uh, when televangelism was, was really getting off the ground, I remember Jimmy Swaggart. He was cousins to uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, the, the early rock, sorry, rockabilly, I guess would be more accurate. And, and he condemned his music and, and that stuff of the devil. And, and he would say things like, you know, that's, that's that, the, the rhythm of that is all wrong. And it's, it's key to, you know, comes from Africa and the devil worship that goes on in Africa. And, 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 and it's about the beat and, and it's about the spirit. And it's about, you, I think you're right, it is about the spirit. Uh, where is your spirit? Okay, but then we have these these things that we're not supposed to violate, like like oh, um, you know, women really should wear dresses to, to a certain length because you know anything shorter than that would be problematic. And <gasps> don't even talk about women wearing. I mean, the idea that a woman would wear pants. Oh my gosh. Okay, but we, but we start taking things that are not scriptural and we start applying meaning to them because scripture says that I, I would that women would dress with decency and propriety. Okay, decency and propriety. What does that mean? Well, for you, it might mean a dress that's down to your ankles. Not you guys. Women, just for you. Not you guys. Not men. Okay? Scripture's clear about that as well. Women dress like women. Men dress like men. Okay? But, but, but with decency and propriety. What does that mean? So let's, let's get a little bit further into what uh, Jesus had to say about this thing. Um, we know, first, that Jesus did not intend in any way to break the law. Okay, in um, Matthew chapter 5, 17 and 18, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Okay, when he says the law or the prophets, what is he referring to? The Hebrew Bible. Yeah, he, our Old Testament. It's, it's the law and the prophets. It's the totality of those writings and everything that they teach. He says, I have not come to abolish them. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Okay, so Jesus came and he kept the law, but when he kept the laws concerning the Sabbath, he allowed his apostles to, to pick the grain. He allowed... Uh, healing on the Sabbath. He was, he was restoring back to the Jews the understanding of God's heart that when God was giving them the Sabbath, He was not giving this to them as a burden. He was giving this to them as a blessing. Okay? Oh. We're going to stop right there. We're going to stop right there. Because next week you're going to hear the rest of the story. Okay? Because when Jesus was here in His ministry on earth, if you were a follower of Jesus, you would have kept the Sabbath. Because if you were a follower of Jesus, guess where He would have been on Sabbath? He would have been in synagogue. He would have been teaching. Uh, it was very, very cool when we were in Israel. They had just, within a year or so beforehand, um, found the, the synagogue at Magdala. Uh, the, the name means fish tower. Mary the Magdalene came from that town. Uh, we know from Scripture that Jesus taught in that synagogue because it talks about him leaving Capernaum and on the Sabbath he, he went and taught in all of the synagogues in the area as was his custom. So we know that Jesus, I got to stand. Well, you know, there was a, a wall I couldn't like go in. Uh, I stood up on top of another wall to look down in. But, but um, I got to see a place that we know Jesus walked. I mean, indisputably, we know that Jesus was there and taught there. So awesome, awesome stuff. Um, so next week, we're going to finish up. We're going to wrap this up, the Sabbath, because we're going to address, okay, why are we meeting today and not yesterday? And, and what is the obligation here? What, what are we obligated to? We're going to start taking a look at Paul, because there's a, a unique trend in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, I challenge you. See if you can find what the trend is in the book of Acts regarding the Sabbath. It's really cool. Very cool. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at, at that trend. We'll take a look at, at the Council of Jerusalem. We'll take a look at some of the further writings in the epistles. And then we'll draw a conclusion based off of these as to where we are at in relation to Sabbath. Okay? Okay? Okay. You don't really have a choice. I mean, you could not come. But that's what I'm doing next week. If you'd like to join me, we'll do it together. Okay? 
All right. Father, we bless you this morning. I thank you, Father. Because your word says that your law is not burdensome. That, Father, you put things into effect to shield us, to guard us. Father, you give us your Holy Spirit to help us walk in these truths. Father, you have set us free from the curse of the law. We thank you, Father, for your grace, your love. But we also thank you, Father, for your purity, for your absolute holiness. We ask, Father, that you would strengthen us that we might walk in a manner which would befit your children. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.